How you doing? Hey, there it is. All right. How's everyone doing? Doing good? Got as good? Is it warm enough out there for you? I guess it's going to... It's going to uh, rain pretty soon, hopefully. Isn't it supposed to rain tomorrow? Tomorrow? So I've got to get my lead. What time is it supposed to rain? Early? Sometime? Tomorrow on Friday. Wow. I've got to get my gutters cleaned. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, pray. Let's ask the Lord to just uh, continue to bless this time. Father, we just thank you so much for your love, and we thank you for your word and uh, Father, we pray that, Lord, your word is powerful. We, we know your word is sharper than any double-edged sword. We know your word is able to convict and your word is able to encourage. But I pray that we would realize tonight what gives, your word is powerful and we'll be judged with, by it whether we obey it or not. But I ask that today we would realize how do we walk in the full power of your word? How do we experience the blessings of your word, that tree planted by those streams of, of water, of living water? And so today I ask that you would open our spiritual eyes and you'd open our spiritual ears and you would give us the mind of Christ that we would be not just uh, hearers of your word, but we would be those effectual doers. We'd be those people that, that take the the owner's manual of life, and we say, Lord, we don't want to just know what's right. We want to live what's right. So God, speak, I pray. Change us, Lord. Let us be, despite what the American church is doing overall, that we would go old school like we learned Sunday. We'd go back to the old ways, and we'd put into practice your word, and you promise if we'll do that, there's going to be blessings. There's going to be rest. There's going to be peace. There's going to be abundance because you promise that you bless those who follow you. So God, we ask that we would be those people. We would be that remnant that is walking in faith and is excitedly waiting for your return. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And the title of today's message is, How is your house? So how is your house? Amen, that's a good question. How is your house, or is your house in order? But how is your house? And uh, hopefully that will make sense to you in a moment. Verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Isn't that amazing how many Christians call Jesus Lord but don't do what he says? You know, 1 John 2, verse 3 says, Anyone who says he has come to know him must walk in the same manner as he did, or he is what? a liar, and the truth is not in him. God says, if you know him, if we know Jesus, we're going to walk like Jesus. Amen? We're not going to be perfect necessarily like Jesus, but we will walk in his ways. Amen? Verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, and hear that, not if the flood, when the flood, how many know that? There's always going to be floods in this world, amen? There's floods coming, it's just a matter of when. And when the flood arose, the, steam, the stream beat vehemently, or the rain beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock, verse 49. But, here's the but. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth or sand without a foundation against which the stream beat or the rain beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. How many know we're seeing that in the American church today, are we not? We're seeing lives that profess Christ, but yet are acting like the world and are experiencing the same ravaging as the world. Can we say a sad amen to that? We see that. Are you guys awake? Hello? Amen. We see divorce is as high in the church as in the world, if not some stats say higher. We see immorality, fornication, adultery, almost as high in the church as the world. We see pornography as high in the church as the world, almost. 
And how many know that should not be so? That shouldn't be normal for us. We shouldn't have the bumper sticker in our car, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Amen? Because why? Jesus said, be perfect as you're having fun. It means, I've heard from Greek scholars, it means be becoming perfect as your heavenly father is perfect amen every day i should be more like jesus than i was yesterday amen i should sin less today than i did yesterday i should be ever giving like what do we sing tonight take it all take it all. we should be saying lord less of me more of you less of my flesh more of you amen but here is the familiar story of two men building houses both men use the same material both built the same on the same location but one made his house, one of the man's house stood while the other man's house fell. The difference was what? The foundation. One built on the rock, Jesus, and the other on sand or earth. In Israel, all of the land became parched, becomes parched during the, uh, the summer months, causing even the sandy, I'm told, even the sandy uh, surfaces to become like appear hard like rock. I don't know if you've ever seen like sandstone when it gets really hard that it'll actually become hard and that's what it looks like so it can kind of appear like a good surface. But the true test doesn't come until what? Until the rain comes. Until hardship comes or struggles come. And how many know that every one of us, I would love what to say that, that uh, life isn't full of hardships, but it is, is it not? David said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Jesus said, if you want to live, or, or it, the Bible says, or, or Paul says, if you want to live a God life, you will suffer persecution. It's a part of walking with God. But how many know this? It's a part of walking just in this sinful world. Amen? Uh, sometime, amen? Sometimes we think, oh, it's so hard to be a Christian. But I love what John Corson says. He says, remember, as it says in the Old Testament, the way of the transgressor is hard. How many know it might be hard to serve God at times? But it's way harder to not serve God and then to what? Have a hard life and then have a harder eternity. Amen? How many know this is the worst it ever gets for us? It only gets better. So you know what I mean? So endure this vapor of hardship a little bit and know, whoo, we're going to heaven and it's going to be all right. Jesus here is saying, be careful where you build your house and how you build your house. Make sure that you build it on something tried and true. And that is who? Jesus Christ, the rock. Who is, the one who, builds, um, who is the one who builds his house upon the rock? The one, hear this, who hears the words of the Lord and what? Does them. Do you see why so many Christians have, they say, I know Jesus, but yet their house falls? Do you understand the why? Because we just think knowing the truth is the same as I always say is what? Living the truth. Who is the one who built his house on the earth and the sand? Jesus says he's the one who hears the words of God, but does not, what, put them into practice. How many Christians do we know where you'll tell them something in the word and they'll say, yeah, whatever. And what does Jesus say? You do that, your house will be built on the sand. Your house will fall like the world because why? How many know the word only has as much power in your life as you give it through obedience. Amen? Yeah, I have this exercise bike at home. And it's a great exercise bike. We spend a lot of money on it. It's an elliptical thing. But I mean, know that bike has absolutely no power if I use it for what I use it for a clothes rack. How I many I mean, know that? It only has power when I step on it and I use it and I actuate it. I, I get moving my body on it. And it's the same with the Word of God. We have the power. We just, what, don't turn the key of our will to obey it. Amen? And it's no fault of the word. Don't hear that. It's our fault of not putting it into practice. Amen? You know, it's like, you know, it's like they say insanity is what? Keep doing the same thing and hoping for a different result. If I went over to those light switches there and I kept just turning it on and off and on and off and nothing happened, after about 10 minutes you say, Craig, hello, did you have a stroke? What happened? You know what I mean? Hello, it's not doing anything. But isn't it weird how we'll keep doing the same wrong things and wonder and have the audacity to ask God, why is my life struggling? That's why the proverb says what? It's a man's own folly or foolishness that ruins his life. Yet his heart, what? Rages against the Lord, blames God. 
you know, blames God, you know. I, I can't tell you how many people I've met who blame God for allowing them to marry a non-Christian. Hello? When God clearly says to not do that, amen? amen. You know, that, that just, it's weird to me, you know? I can be, I can imagine, I can understand them being frustrated with themselves for not listening to God, but turning it on God, like how, I heard someone seriously tell me, how could God let me do what I wanted to do, basically? Isn't it funny? And if God made us do it, then we'd be mad he made us do it. How dare you make me do what I don't want to do? But then when it goes bad, we go what? How could, why didn't you stop me? <laughs> right? Isn't that amazing? I mean, we, it's amazing. It's a good thing I'm just going to say this, and I know you're asleep right now, but it's a good thing I'm not God. Because you all be dead, amen? And if you were God, I'd be dead. So, you know, it's true. I mean, we would be, we wouldn't take what God takes all the time from us, blaming and uh, raging against him. One of the greatest dangers that we have, those of us who love the scripture like we do, amen, we love the scripture, is to think that hearing is the same as doing, or that knowing what is right is the same as doing what is right. Now hear this. You may have said, you may have sat in these chairs and said before, yeah, yeah, Craig, I agree with God, what God says about tithing, but I'm not going to do it. I know I had someone tell me that after I talked about tithing. You know, you wonder why I keep talking about it. I love what, what, uh, what uh, Spurgeon said. He says, I will stop talking about it once you start obeying it. Amen? If we reach budget, I, why would I have to say it? I mean, we need more and more. No, I've told you the budget. We meet the budget. I promise I will shut my yapper. That doesn't mean if we meet. You know, I think sometimes it's so funny. People go, oh, we're doing all right. You know, I want to just tell you this. We got, we, we did all right. We made budget this month, and we're doing, we got half of our deficit, or 8000 down to four. But you want to know what's really sad? You know where most of that money came from? From outside sources that aren't even part of this church. I mean, that's cool, but it's not really cool because how I many know the church should provide for itself? I mean, the members of this body should provide, unless we're all out of work and we're in a famine. But most of us are working, most of us have jobs, and we should be providing for this house, amen? That says something to God when we don't provide for the house that's where we get fed and we, we are ministered to. But you might say, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it, Craig, even though God says what? Hear this, test me. Doesn't he say that? Test me. Now hear me. Now hear me, this is, maybe I'm an extremist, and I, I'll admit I'm a little different than most people, but either that scripture's right, or that scripture's wrong, amen? There's no sort of, kind of right, there's no, well, when everything's, when I have my savings and 401k filled, then I'll give, you know, I'm going to start doing this now, I'm going to have Kevin do this, but I'm going to start giving Kevin all the testimonials of people who have tithed their way out of debt. I mean, old school, not new things. How your seed faith get, not TBN stuff. Stuff of like Quaker Oats and stuff like Kraft Cheese and stuff like J.C. Penney when they used to be around. Stuff like that was phenomenal companies, Ivory Soap, that, that believe so much in giving and they attribute that the blessing they experienced was from giving and honoring God. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I don't know why we don't go, Okay, you know, I told you the neat thing about Chuck Smith, the neat thing about John Castile, is they didn't look at those great men of God and go, whoa, they're so great, I could never be like that. You know what these men did, these great men, I had the privilege of knowing, both not knowing Chuck as well, but I knew, uh, I knew Chuck, but I knew John well, but both these men, I try to hear a common thread, and one thing they said is they go, if God can use George Mueller and teach him faith, then why can't he teach me? Isn't that a good saying? That God's no respecter of persons. Why can't he do it with me? Not a cockiness, but hey, God, they weren't great in themselves. Why won't you? If I yield to you and I obey you, why won't you do it in me? But we sort of don't. We, we say we don't believe in respect of persons, but we do think that. We think, well, you know, George Mueller, God, you know, he picks certain duck, duck, goose, you know, bad, 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 good, you know. No. Anyone can be great in the kingdom of God. It's just a matter of how much will you obey God. And what did Jesus say? You want to be the greatest? Then be a servant. 
Isn't that good? doesn't say, you got to come from a rich family. Sorry, you're a slave, you're a loser. No, you just need to be the servant of all. You just need to serve me by serving others, and you'll be great. Don't you love that about God? I love that everyone is equal in the kingdom of God. There's no male nor female. Everyone can be equal, and everyone can be used. Maybe not the exact same talents, but everyone can be great in the kingdom of God. Amen? No matter where you come from. But anyways, we have to see that. When we see a verse that says, test me from God, we either have to say, well, no, I don't believe that's true, and then let God deal with us in that way, or say, if it's true, then why am I not obeying it? Amen? Because I don't know how you believe that, how you say, we say, right? we say, amen to the word, amen to the word, but then we don't obey it. I, I don't know about you, but that makes me crazy. That makes my hair white. That makes my hair recede, because I don't know what to do. You know, how do I make you and me believe that that scripture means what it says. That when God says, test me, if I'll not open the floodgate of heaven. Test me if I'll not rebuke the devour. Test me if I won't open the floodgates. So it's such a blessing you can't contain it. I don't know why none of us, especially in this economy, would not say, I'm putting you to the test. Because I want that. I want that blessing. I want to be recession proof. Amen. Amen. I told you, you watch. Those little chipmunks you see digging holes all over, they're going to be feeding me someday, okay? Just like they did Elijah, you know? I mean, you watch. It's going to be true. I don't know. have to be dragging big deer carcasses, but it'll be fun. No. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. But the second is we say in these seats, we say, yeah, God, I agree with you on, on not dating a, a non-believer. But still, we say what? Well, I know I shouldn't, but he is so hot. He is so hot. Oh, so Right? And then we do this, girls especially. I think I can change him. <laughs> right? How do we know? If he ain't changed before you get him, he might pretend he's changed to get you. But once you get married, then guess what? <laughs> it rolls out again. Amen? The real person comes out. Amen? We usually don't. <laughs> marriage a lot of times. I how to say this. Marriage was good for me, but how many know? I look like Morgan once. Okay, so marriage has sort of been good, but it's sort of like I relaxed a little. So what I'm saying is, hear me, that if someone is pretending to be a Christian and then they get married, they're going to relax and it ain't going to be good. Amen. So I love what one pastor said, I told you this, stalk them. You see someone you like, stalk them. Now, without the binoculars, don't do that. You get arrested. But stalk them at church. Watch them at church. Watch how they worship. Watch how they pray. Watch if they come consistently. And watch them for a good long time, six months to a year. And then, as you see that faithfulness, then pursue them. Amen? I mean, I'd send you a lot of problems. I hear pastors now saying this. I can't believe it. I heard a pastor on the radio just the other day. You should do a background check on the people you marry. How many of you live in a scary world where you got to do background checks on Christians? But I'm doing one probably for the guy Mariah Mary. So, you know, I'm going to do a background check. You know? I mean, I'm going to do it unless I know the kid, unless I've seen him raised up in this church. If someone just comes in like, here I come to save the day. How many know people can put on a good show? Amen. But nothing is like the test of time. You know, you see someone be faithful for a year, then it's a little hard to fake. But hear this. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, don't be unequally yoked. Yet, as I told you, people have told me many times, how could God let me do what I did against his word? Now, I will tell you, you'll hear that people say, well, Craig, I've had people right here in this pool. I, I did that, and God worked it out. Well, that's awesome. That's great. Amen? Praise God for his mercy. But that's not the norm. And you shouldn't say that to your kids like, hey, you can do it too. You should say, hey, I didn't do it the right way, but God was merciful and praise God it worked out, but I would say, don't do what I did. Amen? Amen? Don't do it. It was the mercy of God, but I shouldn't set it as a precedent. Or they'll say, or people say in this church, they'll say, I agree with the word of God on not divorcing my wife, except for grounds of adultery. Doesn't the Bible say that? Yet how many people do I hear, or I don't know if you've heard, but will say, why? Why are you divorcing her? I just don't love her or him anymore. How many know that's not biblical grounds for divorce? That's what the world says. But the Bible says in Matthew 5.32, what? If you divorce your husband or wife without ground, without them committing adultery or unfaithfulness, you commit adultery if you marry another, and they, what? You force them to commit adultery. That's why the Bible says, what? What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. Now think how much we disobey that today. 
we have we had a guy who was an elder here that was divorced twice as a Christian. I understand divorce, especially before Christ. Amen. There's grace in that. But is a Christian divorcing unless it's adultery? I don't understand that. Amen. I don't, I don't see that. The Bible says that's adultery. You're continuing. You're, you're committing adultery because you cannot just leave for I don't love them anymore. And we know the one guy right on. You know what I'm talking about John, right? This one guy I told you this before. He says he goes. Oh, he goes. Women are nuts. They're just all nuts. And then he married another girl, got divorced from her, and they're nuts. How many know this? I'll give you maybe one nut, but when you marry two nuts in a row, then guess what? You're a wing nut, okay? I mean, you are a nut because guess what? Why are you attracted to nuts? You need to say, Lord, you know, <laughs> I, won't, I better, for the sake of time, <laughs> I won't say what, I, well, I will say this. I got to say this. i never forget, I went to, I used to go to counseling, a Christian counselor. And he was Dr. Thweet, and he was the head of or, uh, at, at uh, university. And he said to me, he goes, Craig, <laughs> I love this. He said, you are so highly dysfunctional. Your family is nuts. You're nuts. And he says, if you see a woman that you go, wow, across a crowded room, he says, run. Because she might be pretty, but she would be the most dysfunctional person in that whole room. How many of that was encouraging? I said, thank you so much. <laughs> but it was true. But from that point on, and that was so neat, I always try to tell Teresa, she gets all mad at me. But when I saw Teresa, I didn't go, <laughs> and you know why I didn't? Because she ain't that good looking. No, I'm kidding. No, I didn't. No, I'm sorry. No, I didn't do it because she's very good looking. But you know why? I want to make sure you're awake. I get that look. Now we're mad at you. You just put down your life. No, she's beautiful, way beautiful than me. Amen. People think I'm her dad, so trust me, I know. But what was amazing is the reason I don't think I was ah, because she was functional and she scared me because I might have to, I, I might really have no excuse not to marry her. Is there any dysfunctional people out there know what I'm talking about? I was kind of afraid. I always liked the, dating the freaks because that way I could always not marry them because I was afraid of marriage. But when I saw Teresa... It was like, I, I gave her such a hard time. I tell you, I made it so hard for her. She goes, hi, how you doing? And she's so nice. And, and I go like this. She goes, hey, how, how can I get involved with CSLife? I was doing this nonprofit. And I go, call the station. I threw a card at her. I mean, I was kind of like anti-women at that time. I was so mad because so many people had ditched me. But, uh, and she still held on. I tell you, when it's God, no matter how much you're a Craig, you can't mess it up, okay? <laughs> and so anyway, so it's okay. But anyway, you get my point, though. There's so many things, and I mean, that's just three, but there's so many things where we go, I know, I know, I know. So you're going to obey? No. You don't know what it's like to counsel people, and here's Christian counseling, basically. I'm not a counselor. I just tell people, I go, we like to do like 25 session of counseling. Well, guess what? I don't do that, because I'm not a counselor. If you want to pay me 120 bucks, I can pretend to be one, but nobody's taking me up on that. I counsel to hear the problem and see where your life is not in agreement with the Word of God. And all I do is see your thing, your area that's not in agreement, and I bring the Word of God to bring your life and the Word together. Amen? But I can't believe how many times that I have counseled people, and, they, and I've said, okay, you, I listen to their story, and I love everyone thinks their story is a new story that I've never heard of it before. I'm like, I've heard, you know, just like you've heard all my stories, I've heard maybe not all your stories, but I've heard this story about a thousand times. There's never where I, I mean, I've heard a few lately where I go, but most of them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh yeah, you know, I have to go, oh my goodness, I've never heard this before, you know, oh my goodness, you know, I mean, but I pretty much, and I, and I have to be careful that I don't go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, let's get, the, I know what to do, I know what to say, I know how to fix you, you know, and I have to sit there and, you know, but hear this, we need that I, I will show people what the word of God says, and they'll go, amen, and they'll agree, and I said, are you going to obey it? No. Isn't that crazy? I know that's what God says to do. I know I need help. But I'm not going to do what God says. You know? That's as dumb as the guy who has emphysema and has the little breathing thing, and he's sucking smoke through his little breathing hole. Have you ever seen that? I mean, how, how much death can you like? We have to be people that have this heart right here. I was telling the kids today, Lord, as long as it's true, I want to do what's right. Just help me, Lord. We just have to bring what? the will. And he will empower us even through his spirit to do. Amen? He works in us to what? 
willing to do according to his good pleasure. But guess what? We've got to do some work because the memory says in Philippians 2, 12, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I would have put that back in the back, but he put that first. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But then he kind of goes, wait a second, it's not all about you. Then he says what? In verse 13, he says, it's God who works in you to will and to do. So it's a partnership, amen? God works. In, I would have put that first in reverse, but hey, I'm not God. But it's God who works in us. It's God who draws us. It's God who gives us the desire. But we have to what? Partner to work with him to work it, allow it to be worked in us. Does that make sense? Because knowing it is not the same as living it. Amen. And having a gym membership and having a, a little, you know, whatever you call it, the little um, what elliptical does not make me in shape, as you can tell. Amen. Doing changes me. Amen. You guys awake? You guys look at me. Anyway, where were we? <coughs> Sadly, if I leave this place and immediately forget what God has told us, if we leave this place, forget what God has told us to do, start doing, or like praying more, or if he tells us to stop doing something, if you don't do it, then Jesus says you are what? A foolish person, and your house is going to collapse. How many know what that house stands for? Your life is going to collapse. Now, isn't it amazing? Can I, can I just, can you just flatter me just now? I know you're tired, but how many of you really do want to have a happy life? Like Phil Roberts, happy, happy, happy. How many want to have a successful marriage, right? How many of you want to have happy kids? How many want to not marry those nut girls or boys, right? Then, then Jesus says, okay, here's the trick. Obey me. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Don't just go, I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to. Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Amen? We have such a need to hear these words of Jesus because we as Bible students are in that, as I said, great danger of being very foolish people who inaccurately conclude that because we're hearing the truth and agreeing with the truth, saying amen, that we are automatically practicing the truth. But hear this. A truly wise person not only hears Jesus' words, but they also put them into practice. Do you hear that? Practice. Practice. And that's why I tell the discipleship kids, when you hear something from God, write it down. Don't go, oh, yeah, yeah, because what will happen? You'll three months later go, oh, my goodness, oh, that thing Jesus told me, I can't believe I forgot it. You've got to write it down because I don't know about you, but as I said, I don't have to water the weeds of my, of my yard. They do great without any water. But the plants that are the good plants, I, if I don't water them, they're like, <clears throat> right? And how many know the same with the Lord? If I don't write that down, I'll forget it in, in two seconds. I need to write it down. I need to put it before me. I need to put it in my smartphone, put it on my day, let it bing, bing me. I get it like 50 times where it says, hello, Craig, Craig, bonehead. Remember, remember, because I will forget it. I will get too busy and I'll forget. Here I am. I'm working for God, but I'm not obeying God. Isn't that weird? God's like, hey, hey. <laughs> Over here. No, I'm sorry, God. I'm too busy working for you. I don't have time to listen to you. I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy. We need to practice. When he does, when, this, when a person does this, his house will be blessed, which is his life. His marriage will be blessed. His work will be blessed. His business will be blessed. And all that he does, hear this, will stand. How many know we need to learn to stand in a world that's what? falling. Does it take a financial genius, right? Betty, you're, you're a financial person. Does it take a genius that we're spending more than we're bringing in and that that's going to stop someday, right? I mean, we, you know, you know what I mean? You spend more than you bring in. What's going to happen with your business? What's going to happen with your family? What's going to happen? Well, guess what? Our government, for some reason, can just sort of print more bills. But someday, somebody's going to say, enough. Now, I don't understand all the ins and outs of that, but I know someday we can't just keep going 17, 18, 19, 50, 000, You know, we can't do it because guess what? It's almost unsustainable right now. We would have a hard time. I think, I forget that, you know, you hear all these stats, but I think just for us to pay, to try to really pay the principal off, 
everyone who's working now would have to pay like 82% of tax. Of ta they would have to be taxed like 82% of their income to even think about punching off that debt. Anyone feel like doing that, stepping up to do that? If we can't tithe, we ain't, we ain't going to want to be taxed 82%. But hear this, those who do this, those who obey, they will stand when the storms of life come. Amen? You'll be able to stand. You know why? I'll tell you, this church has gone through some storms. The church has gone through some financial storms, gone through hardships, gone through betrayals, gone, you name it, splits, everything. But I believe the reason we stand is because of John. He's so good looking. No, okay. The reason we stand is because why? Because we've tried our best to do it God's way. Amen? And what does it say? A righteous man or woman might fall seven times, but he what? Gets up. Because why? He's, his life is on the rock. Amen? His life is on the rock. James 1, 23. Can you turn with me if you would there? And this is my last verse. And I'm going to be almost done in, well, I better not lie, because last time I said I'm almost done, and it was another 40 minutes. So I will not do that, but I think I'm almost done. So you can be excited. You can start napping after this. Amen. <laughs> I don't know why I get discouraged. I don't. <laughs> James 1, 23. Let me know when you get there. Uh, all right. James 1, chapter 1, verse 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it is, is like glancing at your face in a mirror. Verse 24, you see yourself walk away and you forget what you look like. Now think about that for a second. Does everyone understand what that means? Now sometimes we, I used to read that and I used to go, hmm, something about a mirror. I'm not sure what that means, but okay. What that mean? what do you do in the morning? You get up, right? Most of you, well, some people here don't get up and look at a mirror, but most of us look at a mirror, do we not? And what do you do to look at the mirror? Do you go, I'm awesome, and go on? What do you usually look at the mirror to do? You look to see what? The little, like if you're old like me, you get this little like, like, like the little saliva trail thing going on, a white thing. I don't know if I brushed my teeth and didn't rinse enough. But you get weird stuff. You get little boogers. You get an eye sleep. You get little crusties in your eyes. You know, sometimes you get their welded shut in allergy season. You get all these things, and then what happens? You have this big, like, a cow licked your head that night, and you just see. And why do you go look at that? Do you look at it to go, hey, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Do you do that? No. You look at that wreck, or whatever you want to call it, and the older you get, the more wrecky it seems like, right? Because I could run out of the house and be pretty all right. Now I, I got to park for a while. But uh, you look to go what? I got to fix some things. Now, isn't that amazing that that's what James says the Word of God is. It's a mirror that, remember I said like counseling, to here's my life, here's the mirror of the Word, oh my goodness, I'm not in line. My, the Word says that's, that's really not right. Do you see it? We look at the Word not to be like Joel Osteen to say, you're great, everyone's going to start doing the cowlick, it's going to be cool. No, we don't do that, amen? We don't say, hey, you're great, adultery's cool, God's, he, he was just cranky back 2,000 years ago, or three, he's, he's into it now, right? No, we look at the mirror of the word to what? To get our lives in line with it. But when we look at the word just to go, could you, could you, could you? that's not what the mirror, you don't look at the mirror to go, boogers, I hair, awesome. You look at it to fix your face. And especially, do you notice this, parents? All of a sudden, when your little guy or your little girl starts liking girls or guys, all of a sudden, they park in the mirror a little longer. Do you notice that? Right? All of a sudden, there's makeup. And I'm watching, I watch my even little trends starting to do makeup. And I'm like, and she's like Daddy, I've got to get ready. I'm like, who are you getting ready for? You know? I mean, who teaches that? But they, because now, you know, I don't know, there's some Braden or whatever his name is, or some guy that kind of likes her, <laughs> and she's excited about it. I got to go hunting for no, I'm kidding. But anyway, so you know what I mean? We look at it to make ourselves fix ourselves. And so the analogy is we should look at the Word to fix ourselves. 
And I think sometimes we just look at the word for a little encouraging scripture. You're great. You're awesome. Now, how many like that? It's nice that the word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But how many know, that's a lot more for the baby Christian. Amen? Now, some days we need to hear that. But how many know, most of us as mature disciples, most of us here have been around for a while. We should be wanting to start getting the dents out of the car. Amen? We should be wanting to fix the hair. We should be wanting to get the bats out of the cave. Amen? We should be (laughs) wanting to fix stuff, right? The food that stuck in the teeth for three months. You know, we should want to get rid of that stuff and say, hey, we should want to brush our teeth so we don't have the breath of death. Amen? We have some people in the morning that have breath of death. (sighs) Flames come out. It's really cool. But anyway, here it is. Verse 25. But... If you look carefully into... Now, hear this. Notice he doesn't say if you just kind of look at it. Now, how many of you, seriously, do your quiet time in the morning to just punch your card and read? You know, I ask kids all the time, say, hey, you, re- you have a quiet time? Yeah. What you, would you learn? I don't know. I just read. I mean, that's not quite looking at the mirror, man. If you look at the mirror and go, so what was messed with your face? I don't know. I didn't look long enough. Then you didn't really... The mirror didn't do its job. You, well, the mirror did its job. You didn't carefully look long enough amen so hear this you don't read the word we shouldn't read the word just to do it because i feel good i read the word i don't know what it did i don't even know what's wrong with me but i feel good we need to read the word carefully you know i really read the word slowly because i'm not the, i'm not a great reader but i read it slowly because i always thought why am i reading this if i don't understand this i need to understand what it's telling me i need to know what it's saying to do or what not to do amen so we need to read it carefully. It says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law, isn't that weird? He uses the word law in the New Testament. Law, the word of God, the do's and don'ts that sets you free. Hear that. So if the law sets you free, obedience, what does not obeying the law do for you? It enslaves you. Not obeying God's word will what? Make your house fall. Amen? Obeying the word will set you what? free. It'll set you free from the entanglements, a lot of the entanglements of life. It'll set you free from marrying the wrong person. It'll set you free from getting divorced for not a biblical reason. It'll set you free from financial ruin because you don't obey God in the biblical principles of sowing and reaping. Amen? The law will set you free. And hear this, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, You want to hear something really encouraging for pastors? They say on Sunday morning, or on Monday morning, you're lucky if you retain 20% of what I've said. 20%. That's why it's important to take notes. Because some of you tonight, the way your faces are, you're going to be lucky if you retain 2% of what I said. Amen? Yeah, right there. There's Brent's going. There you go. He says, if you, if you do what is, it says and don't forget what you heard. Hear that? So what is why? Write it down. Write it down. When God speaks to you through what you're reading or what I'm saying or what you hear on the radio, as fast as you can, write it down. And if God tells you to do something or stop, then write it down. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Right? If you heard the cure for cancer, you would write it down. Right? You wouldn't go, eh, I'll, I'll try to remember it later. Boom. You would write it down. Write down what God says. If you don't forget what you heard, then hear this. Here's the promise. God will bless you for what? For just wishing you would do it. No. He says he'll bless you for what? Doing it. So let's reverse that. Wishing to do, will it bless you? No. No. Satan wishes he hadn't. How many of how many, Really, if Satan sat down for a second and really thought about what he did, how many know he wishes he hadn't done what he did? I mean, probably for a second. I, mean, I don't think he thinks that long. But how many know he probably goes, this probably wasn't smart. Because I think it's pretty nervy of him that he has to always ask God what to do, but yet he somehow thinks one day he's going to break the chain and come against God and defeat him. That's pretty weird. You know what I mean? That'd be like me putting my hand against Andy, and he's trying to hit me, and all of a sudden I'm holding him like this, he's just going, mm, and all of a sudden he's thinking one day I'm just going to let go and let him hit me. I mean, why would I do that? Why would God do that? But somehow Satan is goofy to think that. But it isn't just to know the truth. 
It isn't just to know the word. It's only when you do it, when you hear it and then do it, that you and I will be blessed. Do you hear the point, church? The point is, as my grandma would say, the point is that we need to be doers of the word. Amen? The point is that I was telling the kids this morning that you can read all the scriptures you want. You can memorize. You can, you can, you can uh, write it down. But if you don't do it, then guess what? I told you what Blackaby said, and I was telling the kids today. I said, how many of you can say like David, you really hear the voice of God? Now think about it. I'm not going to ask you because I know you won't raise your hand. But most of you here, if you're honest, you don't hear the voice of God consistently. Yet David could be at Ziglag, be having his, his own men wanting to stone him because all their stuff was taken. And what did David do? Remember he got drunk and he partied and he felt sorry for himself. No, David what? He encouraged himself, one, in the Lord, and then what? He heard from God what to do, and he got everything back and more. How many like to be able to hear like that? Most of us can't hear if, if I said, hey, you've got to hear from God today or else you're going to die. Most of us go, oh, I'm dead, right? But you know what? I love what Henry Blackaby said. You know why we don't hear from God? It's not because why? The Bible says hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So he's speaking. But guess what? We're not listening. And we might listen, but when he tells you to do something, we then say, hmm, nice suggestion. I'll think about it. How many know a holy, awesome God does not go, what? What did you say? He does not like that response. How many, how many know what I'm saying? Think about as a parent. Would you like your kid to go? If I say, Mariah, I want you to clean your room. And she goes, if I don't have any, anything better to do, I might try to fit it in. Yeah. How many know I'd be a little torqued? But I'm sinful and I demand obedience, right? You remember that, parents? Anyone saying, you will do what I say, young man. You ever remember those days? No, just think about it. Just, just wish it. Just try, you know. You say, do it. Right? Remember those? Don't you say as a parent? Right? Do you? Don't you give me that look? At me. You will. You want a fresh one? You know. I mean, come on. And yet we do that with God, and then we wonder why God does not speak to us. And I love what Pastor Chuck says. I wish I was smart as he was. He says God will not show us step B until we obey step A. And a lot of us need to go back if you want to hear from God, and hopefully all of us do. And say, God, what was the last thing you asked me to do that I blew off? That I just thought, well, just knowing it is enough. And I asked God, and guess what? <laughs> Within a second, God said, this is what you did. And I went, <gasps> how many know that? How many, you want a prayer that God will always answer? Here's your prayer. Say this. You can even say it cocky. God, I know I, you don't really have to change much of this. But is there by any chance anything that you would like to change today? How many know that's a prayer he will answer, right? Is there, is there anything that I do that upsets you? Is there anything that you would want to do to improve on this? How many know if you pray that and mean it, you're going to get an answer faster? You're going to get a <laughs> scroll is going to fall. From, I mean, you're going to hear something. How many can say amen to that? Amen. And we were saying to the disciples, you know why we don't ask? Because we don't want to hear. We kind of think this, like ignorance is bliss. If I don't know what he wants, I can't be held accountable. Oh, yes, you will. And yes, you can. Because why? You were ignoring him. And I love what Henry says. And he says this to Baptist. God's never spoken to you? No, never, never. He goes, seriously, never God's asked you to do anything? Oh, there was that one thing. Amen? All of us have a one thing. And it might be one thing 10 years ago. It might be one thing 20 years ago. Hopefully not that bad for most of us. But there is that one thing. And how many know, if God Almighty has told you to do something and you've blown it off, guess what God's stuck at right there saying, until you obey that, I'm not going to tell you a new thing. Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because God just chose him to be. No. It says he was a man after God's own heart twice. Because why? He did everything God asked me to do. It says in the Old Testament, it says in the New Testament, it says in Acts, because he did everything God asked me to do. I love it. In Acts, it says nothing about, I'm going, did he want him to cheat, did, uh, you know, do the Bathsheba thing? I love in the Old Testament, 
uh, under grace, it says, he did everything God asked him to do except for the time with Uriah the Hittite and his wife Bathsheba. Isn't it amazing? His heart was what? Your wish is my command. I will do what you say. You tell me to stop something, I'll stop it. You tell me to do something, I'll do it. And hear this, guys. Most of our prayers is what? It's self-centered, is it not? It's, Lord, bless my day. Lord, bless what I'm doing. Lord, I'm going to do this. You bless this. And what is true prayer? C.S. Lewis says, prayer is not to change God. Prayer is us to get in line with God. Prayer is us to get in what he's doing because he has a plan for our lives and we just need to get in that plan. Now, I'm not saying quit your job and wait for God's plan. Do your job and seek the plan of God in the midst of your job. Does that make sense to you? And commit your heart to say, God, do you see the difference? Does that make sense to you? That it's not telling God, you know, bless me. It's saying, God, what do you want me to do? What is like the priority in in what is your priority for my life? What would you like to change today? What would you like me to do today? And when you do that, you're going to be a mighty man or woman of God, just like David, because why? Your heart is going to be after his. Amen? I want to end with this, James 1.22. You don't have to turn there. You're right there. Well, you're right there. Just go up. But he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Why? deceiving yourselves of what? Because there's no power in just knowing the word. There's only power in what? Doing the word. Living the word of God. Amen? And the reason, hear this, I'll end with this. The reason there's no power in the church, it ain't God. It ain't God having going, I don't like America. America, mmm. The reason why there's revival in every other place but America you know that? There really is revival and there's a revival in Iraq. Is because why? When those people who have been so oppressed find Jesus, they're like, everything. It's yours. I'll, I'll even die for you. There, I, I just saw a video, Teresa showed me, of this uh, uh, Iranian pastor was in Iran where the guy got acid or was that in Africa? Anyway, this pastor, but Muslims came into his church and threw acid on his face. He lost his eye and his whole face was saying, He's not going, <laughs> what would we, what would I do? <laughs> this is what I give. So I just give it, I, right? I'd be done. He's like, I'm going to keep, keep going. Keep praising God. Keep, keep serving him. Because why? They believe that they owe God their life. They believe that I was lost and going to hell, and your wish is I live to obey you. Because you know what? They're used to oppression. They're used to, you will obey or I will kill you. And when they find Jesus says, I love you, now they do out of love. They're like, this is awesome. But what have we done? We go, man, Jesus is a softy. So that means I can just say whatever, dude, and I don't have to do anything he says. How do know? Why does Paul say this? What a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. If God is such a softy, whatever, dude, kind of God, why does he say, hey, be careful, and read, read, read First Romans 11 when he says, and hear this, you never hear this preached. Remember both the kindness, we hear that preached every sermon, but he says, remember both the kindness and what? Severity of our God. What? What? That's in the New Testament? What? I thought it was only in the Old Testament. Severity. Why? Severity to those who disobey. I wasn't told that. I thought my God didn't care. He cares. And if we are smart, we're going to start to care because why? Not of, <laughs> but out of, hey, <laughs> he's worthy. And why am, I, why am I playing this game if I'm not really into it? I mean, why do you think Jesus is either hot or cold, in or out? Don't be sort of lukewarm. And you know, I played that game in this church where I've said, how many of you are hot for Jesus? And one person, <laughs> and I'm like, you? I mean, seriously, it was like, Mm, I know you. You're not that hot. Okay? You might think you're hot, but you ain't that hot, girlfriend. Right? But I said, how many of you are cold? And one guy was funny. His wife made him come. He goes, I am. My wife made me come. I hate this church. I don't want to be here. Right? I was like, wow, amazing, honest. And then I said, how many of you? You're not hot. You're not cool. You're just right. And guess what? 99% of you went, oh, that's me. And guess what Jesus says? Blah. So, 
Let's pick a team and get on it. Let's pick a team of either being rebel against him and just say, I'm done, I'm going to be cold, or get hot and say, you know what, I'm going to be like David. I'm going to be a man who obeys God with all my heart, or a woman. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. <clears throat> I pray that, Lord, I know people are tired, they work hard, and it's hot. But I ask, Lord, that this principle of obeying you would be not something we just sort of listen to here and then forget in two minutes. But I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would sear this into my brain, sear this into my heart, sear this into our hearts and minds to where we hear your Spirit say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Why do you say you know this truth is, you know this is right, but then you don't do it? How can you do that? And that we would answer that question. We would, re we, would, we would wrestle with that question of, yeah, how can I call you Lord and say, no, Lord? If you're Lord, that means I should obey. Why am I not obeying? And so, God, I, as I was talking to Andy today, and I think we were on to something, is we kind of have this belief of, well, ignorance is bliss. That if I just don't listen, then I won't be accountable, and, and then it's all good. But yet you say what? Kindness to those who obey and those who believe, but severity to those who disobey. And just like the law says in America, which most of our laws came from your word, ignorance is no excuse. Let us remember that you know our hearts through and through, and you know if we're ignoring you willfully, Lord. Just like a mom knows when her child is ignoring her or, or uh, a wife knows when her husband's ignoring her, and nobody likes that. And let us be saddened when we do that to you, Lord. I just want to repent from that, God. I want to repent of believing the lie that somehow just not listening, being so busy that I don't wait on you, that somehow that does not make me guilty of disobedience. Help me to be like your servant, David. Give me that double as... as as Elijah or Elisha prayed for a double portion of, of Elisha's, Elijah's heart, I pray for a double portion of David's heart, everything but the Bathsheba part. I pray, Lord, to, for all of us that we'd have those hearts that longs to do everything God wants us to do, that we could be like David, who was fruitful, who was blessed, who had favor with the people. Lord, let us want that again for our lives, our marriages, our businesses, our workplaces, our country, our church, that we would want a blessing. We'd want the favor of God on us because we please you, because our heart is to obey you out of love. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.